Hey, I'm up on my roof in uh, beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, California, and I decided to, uh, hold on one second, I gotta make sure this headset's not gonna shut off on me, mid-podcast, it's like I need to have some audio on in the background, very low trick my headphones into thinking that I'm still here. If, if there's no audio coming through, then they think that I'm gone and they want to auto shut off for me. Which is a nice feature. Uh, and maybe there's a way to turn it off. I, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, a friend of mine on Facebook asked me to start podcasting, which I've always thought... Um, it's just like, what do you call it? Do you call it YouTube videos? Uh, do you call it making videos? Do you call it uh, a podcast? It seems like something you would just listen to, maybe uh, upload on iTunes. I don't know. I don't really know the difference, get the difference or anything like that. There's, but there's uh, different venues to put your content. You know, YouTube, Minds, Facebook, Instagram. You can go on Apple Store, upload them to uh, the iTunes Store, and, and so on and so on. But I think it's a good idea to get out here and start talking more. So I came up on my roof, which is it's pretty much a public forum. I mean, it's not public, but, uh, you know, my building, I think, has about 100 people that live in it or so. So uh, people might come up here and start hanging out. It's getting oops, sorry, it's getting close to the afternoon until 5 o'clock when people are going to start uh, lounging. And I don't want to dominate the space, which looks like this, by the way. Very, very nice. Very nice. He's very nice. Oh, let me unwind that. So, uh, I think it's a great idea, and I think up here is a nice place for it. But my apartment's also nice. So I decided I hate cleaning. I mean, I don't hate cleaning, but it's, it's one of my least favorite day-to-day -day tasks to do. You know, showering I like, brushing my teeth I don't mind. Fucking cleaning grimy dirt, it's just the never-ending process of cleaning cleaning is it just doesn't thrill me so I'm, I hired someone to come in and clean my apartment which is the first time I've ever really done that other than when I'm moving I almost always now hire a cleaner when I move because one time I don't know if it was in Chicago I think I was in Chicago and we moved and and I didn't hire a cleaner I decided to do it myself save like three four three hundred a few hundred bucks and the I got a, a letter afterwards that was like this wasn't clean enough and this wasn't clean enough so we're charging you another sixty seven dollars for these items and for the and for the the work that needed to be done and then someone was like you know what from now on just hire a cleaner whenever you move and then get an itemized receipt of everything they cleaned so that you can present that to your your manager your landlord or whatever and uh it's proof they can't charge you for it again if you've already paid to have it cleaned so that aside i'm just getting a cleaner to help me clean my house and then I'm going to start having parties in there because right now it's not happening. And I'm also going to podcast from in there or make videos from in there because, one, it's private, and then, two, it's a nice place. It's really nice. It's got palm trees right outside. Hey, trees. Hey, bushes. Hope this feels good for you. Well, there's a lot going on, huh? This, uh, this crazy world. I was watching a Joe Rogan podcast last night. I wonder how many times I'm going to say podcast today. Uh, and uh, who was it? What's her name? This is most recent one. Her name starts with an M. Her first and last name both start with an M. But I don't, it was the first time I ever saw her, and I don't remember her, exactly her name, but they were talking about fucking Yellowstone. Yosemite? Apparently that's a, 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 a dormant super volcano. And uh, this last week, they clocked like 250 mini earthquakes underneath the volcano. So I'm into collective consciousness. I truly believe that we are connected to the universe beyond what we think as humans, like get up, go to school, come home, go to bed. You know, your walls protect you from outside. What's out there is there and what's in here is here. But it's like, I, I really kind of realize along with many, many millions of other people in ancient cultures and modern cultures that things are way more connected than we were taught in school than I was taught in school so and if you see a volcano a lot of times if you look up in outer space above an active volcano you'll see lightning surges 
well, wait, let me get this straight. If you watch a lightning storm, like if there's lightning up in the sky and you see lightning striking, up above that in space, if you go up into the stratosphere and look at it, you'll see giant, as the lightning's striking the Earth, you'll see giant bolts shooting up into the universe above it. So in that, I, I see that as a connection of our thunder, of our lightning storms to uh, you know, galactic or universal activity, electricity. And volcanoes, if you ever look close at an active volcano, you'll see lightning in the, uh, the clouds and the, the storm above it because there's a lot of iron involved, which has a magnetic field. So the lightning, I would assume that then means that the volcano is also tapped into the galaxy or the galactic energy field somehow. So this connection of how we feel that's feeding the universe is definitely related to active volcano activity. I mean, I, it's hard to say definitely because I have no proof. None. I have no proof. But it seems like it. And it seems like the more agitated people become, the the more agitated the earth becomes almost. And I'm like, what is the point? You know, the other night I'm thinking, what is the fucking point? What am I doing here? Like really like an out of the box, if I'm at this energy field coming from a, a other place in the universe and animating this body, you know, like God, if I'm God, like living and experiencing reality through this three dimensional form, what's the point to master the third dimension maybe? But like, what does that mean? Is humans, humanity's point to, to, to look so small that we see uh, particles that when we interact with them, we see and we can see so big that we see a direct correlation between the imp these tiny, tiny, tiny motions and extra gravitational field motions and things like in outer space. And I mean, that's cool, but is that the point? No, I think, and then the point was like, just be cool, man. Just be relaxed. Make calm everybody down. I think maybe that's the point. We're here to make it sure everyone's can chill out. I'm not talking about freeze. I'm just talking about let's get along. Let's get along. Let's get along. Oh my God, is it really this choppy? You know, if the video's choppy, I don't think I can. I don't think I can do this. After all that, the video is choppy. I am going to have to find out if this video is choppy, so I'm going to end the recording for the moment. Okay, it may have been choppy, but I'm just going to roll with it. Choppy, by the name, by the way, was one of my uh, World of Warcraft heroes. It was my orcish hunter named Choppy. He carried around an axe from time to time and also had a pet dog or something, you know, a bunch of animals that he tamed throughout the years. Well, video game years, which were like hours for me or days. Uh, you know, the real reason I uh, opted to do this was because my friend who, what the fuck is your name, dude? I'm going to find out real quick. I think that part of the reason why my, my processes were chopping around is because I had video online. So I know how I'll circumvent that. Just recently, a friend of mine contacted me on YouTube, or on uh, Facebook, actually, and uh, Philip, Phil Wong. And we were talking about, you know, self-help and feeling good and feeling bad and like how to take care of yourself. And a lot of it's about taking care of your body, your vessel. God, it's fat. You know, I, it's not like I, I, I'm, my nose is up Joe Rogan's butt, but I always thought he was a funny guy. And when he talks about, he, he visualizes your body as a battery. This is a very interesting metaphor. And that it, it charges it, it's got this charge, and if you don't work it out, if you don't discharge, you you have this like excessive amount of it. Or if you have somehow not worked it out, if you're unable to discharge for whatever reason, I think meditation helps too, because I, I'll drink a lot of coffee, or I'll get like supercharged, but then I can be really calm, and I don't. Well, I work out a little bit. Maybe I'm discharging it with with my thoughts, with meditation, or something. But if you don't discharge your uh, your energy battery you're prone to like random acts of discharge by like, hey, you know. Like, so a lot of it's about taking care of your body. A lot of it, a lot of universal collision. <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely about taking care of your body. <sighs> That's 
why I drink so much water. I was talking the other day with my friend Bryce about if we decided to fast. He was like, man, if me and you fasted, I would, you would, I would last so much longer than you because I have extra body fat. And then we got to talking about like holding your breath and how like when you're in a state of meditation, you don't digest food, you don't need oxygen, like you kind of go into a stasis and I'm getting pretty good at that. I've gotten extremely good at that throughout the years. They called it sleep apnea, like in college, my professor would be like, Ian, are you okay? Which is so funny. Chuck Ritchie, uh, one of my professors, I was telling Bryce this story that he would come over every, every once in a while, I'd like be in this like meditative state, I wouldn't be moving. He'd be like, are you okay? And I'd go, yeah. He'd say, you weren't breathing. And I would think, oh, okay, thanks, I guess. I, but I was, it's like this, you know, meditative trance, AKA sleep apnea. But the funny thing is I saw Chuck Ritchie on Facebook, like, and he just friended me yesterday after having that conversation. I haven't seen the guy in like 12 years, more, more than that. I haven't seen him in like, in like, 17 years, but he just friended me yesterday after, after that great story of him. I still think of how he used to wake He's the kindest guy. If you don't know Chuck Ritchie, you got to meet him. He's a fan, fantastic human. Um, and then I w this whole conversation, after I had this conversation with Bryce, I started thinking, man, I couldn't do jack shit without water. I think of myself as like this resilient meditative beast that can handle any obstacle and like can survive in just crazy environments, but then I always go back to the water. If my water glass is empty, I go pour myself another and make sure that my jug is always massively filled for the most part. And if I'm ever feeling down or crappy, I drink water. So without the water, I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd be so hot. I don't know if I'd be able to speak so boldly of myself. You know, we are just chemical processes. As much as I want to think that I'm this like godlike creation that can handle any stress, I'm more of a chemical process that's a result of my surroundings. Because if someone came and like ripped off my legs, well, th I'd be a different world. If my teeth got busted out, or if I was like had half my face removed, I mean, I'd still be me, but it would be a completely different environment than what I'm experiencing. And I keep being told this is transient. It's not like a permanent. It feels like, yeah, you got your arms and your legs and your mobility and everything's good, but like things can change abruptly. Like your tooth can crack off all of a sudden. This is one thing about dental hygiene. It's like important you gotta constantly like, it's not like they're like, okay, tomorrow it's gonna happen. They're like, hey, just a reminder in six hours, something's gonna change in your life. Like it just happened. Like things just happened and then you have to like, then the reality is what it is now. So like what we have now, which is really fucking good, we really need to take advantage of. Your body is fully motionable. You have li limitless potential. I mean, the potential of what we can do as humans in this day and age of this culture is fucking fantastic. The way we can interact with this medium, the media, the video, the online internet video, dude, we can change drastic amounts of things very quickly for the better. The earth and the environment needs our help in such a way that we need to cool down the atmosphere and feed the fish. So there's this thing called iron fertilization. You may have heard of it. And uh, they figured out that if you fertilize the ocean, i.e. if you put iron oxide dust into the ocean, it allows the plankton to bloom. The plankton actually eat the iron oxide dust. And the plankton bloom, they thought, would do two things. One, it would absorb carbon dioxide from the air because plankton eats carbon dioxide, and that it would purify the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. The other is that it would produce food for the fish. And after testing it, they realize it, it doesn't really have the impact on the carbon dioxide that they thought it would as a very small amount of impact on the carbon dioxide. So it's not really an environmental cleaner, but it is the food for the fish in the sea because, well, there's a lot of ways to look at it. If, we, if our glaciers melt and we dump tons of cold water into the oceans, it's gonna kill a lot of fish. A lot of fish are gonna have to relocate. They're gonna be looking for food. You know, you have whales coming to shore. Sharks are gonna be coming up on the shore looking for food. Fish are gonna learn how to fucking walk with their flippers to get to food on the beach. Like we don't wanna be in a position where we have to be afraid of stuff coming up out of the ocean to eat us. So we really need to feed the fish. 
and this, this iron fertilization is a tactic we could use for that. I think that if we spray water into the, uh, into the atmosphere, maybe up into the stratosphere, the ionosphere, we'll be able to regrow ozone, cool it down, and kind of help maintain a homeostasis on Earth, which we've been rapidly diluting with all this carbon burning. And we can move this carbon, these carbon industries to Mars, uh, do full-scale oil and gas and methane oil and coal burning on Mars. Not only will it produce the electricity we need to uh, sustain culture, it will pour carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and heat it up, which is what we need to do to terraform the planet to make a breathable atmosphere. I think a lot about water on Mars and like producing rivers and all that stuff on Mars. I was thinking the other day too, maybe we could fire carbon, like we could freeze carbon dioxide and shoot it into the Martian atmosphere where then it would regasify, regaseousness regasify, but uh, Bryce, who's a brilliant engineer, really close friend of mine, we game a lot. Uh, I've known him since kindergarten. He was like, ah, then you gotta get it there. You know, then you gotta figure out how to cool it down, which takes a lot of energy, and then you need to propel it there. It takes a long time to get there. Then you need to make sure that it dissipates, evaporates when it arrives. And then that was what led me to the whole burning it on the planet, which, I mean, it's a win-win for everybody. If we can get like Exxon, Shell, if we can get these companies off world and go put them on Mars, they're making shitloads of money. They're still producing energy for people that need it. And we're all growing the, the, planet's, the planet's atmosphere while on Earth we're able to clean it up a little bit, remove the carbon dioxide slowly. You can take carbon out of the atmosphere to print graphene. These um, Australian scientists figured out a way to deposit carbon dioxide on, I think it's ammonia borane, and it happens at, I think, what's uh, 30 PSI, which is room pressure. So you don't need to pressurize the system, but it's 100 degrees Celsius, boiling point of water. And on the ammonia borane deposits the carbon dioxide, or actually the carbon from the carbon dioxide. And then you're able to uh, chemically remove the two and come up with graphene which is carbon, I think, and it might actually produce graphene oxide, this process that I was reading about. And this is an old process. It's like a two-year-old process that they figured out. So instead of mining to get the carbon out of the dirt or whatever, you can get it out of the air. I'm very hopeful for the future of humanity. I think a big part of our job is to cool people down and just make sure people know that it's okay and there is hope and there is a future for us. Now, as for the other animals, it's a question I'd like to ask you. Are we that racist that we need to kill off all the other creatures? I mean, if, if, if the world was full of alligators, we'd be fucked. We'd constantly be having to fight them and defend against them. If the world was full of hawks, tons and tons of hungry hawks that eat meat, we'd have to run for our lives when we were out and about. So we've, we've taken the really the most dangerous animals and killed them off, like the, the short-nosed bear. I think this is what this thing called this giant, what is he, 15, 18 foot bear? Oh God, look this thing up, this thing is sick. So there's, you know, Graham Hancock talks about like the past civilizations before the end of the last ice age when the earth flooded and sea levels rose 18 feet. Potentially that, you know, Malaysia, Southeastern uh, Asia was like huge all above water. So I think a lot of ancient culture we're gonna find underwater in the Malaysian area, but that People, not only did maybe they walked across the land bridge, maybe people crossed from Asia into North America, which is why like Native American Indians ha kind of have similar features to Asian, like uh, some of the Chinese features or like some of the Asian features. Like it's almost like the wind below, like the eyes of like accustomed to blockade the wind. And uh, so over generations and, and millennia, they've, they've just evolved to have that feature. And, uh, but then people are like, there's no way they could have walked that. It would have been too dangerous. The short-nosed bear dominated the North American peninsula, like the North American continent, it just owned it. So people probably took boats. They probably took small boats around the coast, up around Alaska, and down the Western coast. And that's how they populated North and South America, which is why like South American natives have also have that similar feature of the wind-blown face. And I'm assuming it's wind-blown, I don't know for sure. But it's fascinating to think that that's that's possible. So when they we start they, we started talking about the uh, the boats, 
that's this is like a theory that a lot of people can get down with about like where did the people in North America come from? Where did these humans come from back in the day? Boats. They came around on, on coastal boats, boats that couldn't handle the deep. And also if there's a lot more land, it might have been way easier to navigate. And so I'm thinking like, you know, people were already on Japan before the flood. Hawaii, maybe people were already on Hawaii before the flood. I, I really don't know how the how far back that goes. Man, they keep finding older and older information, like 400,000 years, 300,000 years, 350,000 years. People like, people have been around a long time, man. Oh, wow, yeah, I'm thinking about the government and about uh, what that means to the government, like to control the mind. Govern is to control and ment is like the, the Latin term for mind. So we've created like a mind control system that basically is like a set of rules, you know, like don't kill, don't steal, don't rape, be nice. Not That's not really a rule, but it's, it's nice when you're nice. And so the government, the government's job, the, the issuance of the government is to basically make sure everything is running smoothly. And if we need to do something to make sure it runs smoothly, that will be the new government. So what I'm working on, you know, is technology, designing minds and facilitating what we need a technological way. I think that the government's already in place. We are capable of controlling our own destiny. And when we have the right technology, we don't have to rely on like representatives. We can get it done really fast and in a fantastically democratic way. I wonder here about like representative democracy and uh, if it was a true democracy, if we had a true democracy where the majority vote won, it may not work very well because let's say that Donald Trump in, in a post-presidential democracy where no one's a president, everyone just makes laws and offers the ideas for laws and people can vote on them and put them into place and the computer, you know, the system makes sure that all the votes are tallied and everyone's taken care of, everyone's beliefs are taken into account, everyone gets to vote on everybody's ideas. Um, it's easy for everyone to access so everyone has access to all the ideas in a system like that, someone like Donald Trump or someone that's like a popular reality star, whoever, or me, or whoever, decides I want to make a law that you drive on the left side of the street now. Or let's, let's make it a little more a little more realistic. I want to make a law that basic income happens. Everybody in the United States gets $1,200 a month before untaxed for the rest of their life, for everyone from the age of 18 on. And then I got 51% of the population to vote for me. Not only would 49% not get their way, which is just as bad as 51% not getting their way realistically, 2%'s not a big deal. Not only does half the people get fucked, I, I'm setting a dangerous precedent because then I could say, I wanna go to war with these people. Not that I would say that, but someone that wanted to, to pass a law, I wanna go to war with these people. If they got 51% of the people behind them, it would happen. And if it's a bad idea, there's no stopgap. There's no like representation or, or group of representatives that are there to say like, no. So maybe direct democracy is not the answer, which drives me absolutely nuts because since I've been 15 years old, I've talked about direct democracy and thought it was absolutely the best way to go. Without a doubt, hands down, I never questioned it. If everyone came together and the majority ruled, there we are. That's the best thing you could possibly do, but that's just not the way it works. If somehow you could measure people's like uh, st beliefs or stability or like if everyone could vote on to, to put like their person's uh, their their idea into a pool and then all the different ideas got put into a pool and then everyone voted on every idea 
you're, it's still a popularity contest. And in situations like that, the ideas don't speak for themselves. The people that are speaking about the ideas are persuading to get those ideas implemented. If only ideas spoke for themselves, every once in a while maybe an idea does speak for itself, like, run! If there's a fire, you run, or whatever. You know, that's that. You don't need to beat into people's minds, but a lot of things is just a, a persuasive popularity contest, which is a bit disturbing, I'm not going to lie to you. And in that, in that case, I almost feel more comfortable having an AI run, run the show. But mm, mm, yeah, who programmed the AI? Oh, sorry. Who, who programmed the AI? Who programs the AI that we have to... Yeah, no, I think... Well, there, because there's another idea of anarchy. That anarchy is that you govern yourself. There is no government. Not that there are no rules, but that there's no government. There's no outside force uh, deciding what you have to do and when you have to do it or, or what. But see, and that's another extreme that I don't fall in line with because of like, I'm into certain social, social programs like socialism in like the fire department. If it was a pure anarchy, if we all just took care of ourselves here, well, one, who's gonna grow the food? And th who gets to decide how much they charge for that food? If it's a, if it's a, hey, broccoli is just happens to be ninety dollars a pound today, no one can step in to say no. Like the government, through use of force in the military, says no, farmer, you can't sell broccoli for ninety pounds or ninety dollars a pound. You have to sell it for a dollar seventy-five a pound because there's so much of it. You're not allowed to strangle this commodity. It's too, it's too needed by people. Which we can, our government should probably do with electricity, internet. You know, we should be saying no. It has to be cheap and free, borderline free for people. So in an anarchy, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be able to happen. You'd have a fire department, and it's like, who gets the fire? Who gets the help of the fire department? Is it, they're, they're just doing it because they get paid, right? Maybe in a post-money society, anarchy would function. But then you're talking like a post-resource-based economy, which is... Granted, we could get there with atomic and molecular printers. We could shrink it down and make it cheap enough that everyone's got can print their broccoli here or can print a fire hose, or can print water. And it's honestly, it's very there, but then uh, there, there are structures in place that are afraid of that, because if you had the power of fusion, if you had enough power to destroy, a, 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 there's so much power in a fusion reactor that if everyone had one on their tabletop and decided to use it for nefarious purposes, we'd be in a, we could arguably be in a lot of trouble. Maybe, maybe you would argue that point. Maybe people are great enough that if they had the responsibility of nuclear weaponry at their fingertips that we'd all be okay anyway. Even if everyone had a nuclear bomb in their pocket, maybe we'd still be fine. Maybe. But in situations like that, the government comes in and regulates. You can't walk around town with hand grenades and bazookas. You know, an armed bazooka. That you're just not allowed to have that. In an anarchy, you could have that. Because there's no, there's no law. Well, no, there's no government. But there could be law, but then where does that law end? It, in your vicinity, like, yeah, you can have a you can have a bazooka here, but not over there. That's anarchy. So I, I'm not a big fan of anarchy. I think anarchic purposes. There are some that work, like uh, drugs. I'm not a big fan of like drug regulation. Drugs, a lot of propaganda too. Like the whole the medical industry is a big uh, propaganda war with drugs. It's a big propaganda push for, for drugs like Effexor, Wellbutrin, Klonopin. These are all like, they have commercials. They have these propaganda campaigns to make you think, I'm supposed to go get Klonopin. And you're not supposed to go get Klonopin. Eat fucking garlic, broccoli, and spinach. You won't need Klonopin. Cut the sugar out of your diet. Don't eat bread, man. You'll feel fine after a couple weeks. You'll be back to normal. But the, the drug propaganda is like massive. So in an, an, in, in an anarchy, if, if our drug system was truly anarchic, or anarchistic, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, anarchic, anarchic, that you'd still have people pushing propaganda. Like anarchy doesn't mean you're not allowed to publicize your your products and if I was a meth if I grew meth if I brewed meth methamphetamines and in, in an anarchy where all drugs were legal I would could put up billboards and posters outside that would show come get my meth it's the best meth in town 
And then I make a video like d snorting the meth and being like, I feel fucking amazing right now, you know? And it'd be like fucking severely dangerous because some types of methamphetamine are severely dangerous or like, you know, a lot of drugs can be like really, really addictive and dangerous in society. There's just, I don't even know if there's a perfect answer. I don't think there's a perfect answer, but there's a better system, that's for sure. There's a better system than what we have now. And I think a lot of it has to do with voting on the internet, creating laws, creating and voting on laws through like an internet database. I mean, with the blockchain coming, which is this online encrypted public database, we can really do a lot of good democratic social work on the internet. And with VR, I, and with VR, I'm thinking very far ahead, but like you're, you'll be able to simulate like potential realities, outcomes, but then it's, it's, it, that's a lot of propaganda too. Like who, who's running the calculations? Is it just a binary, a non-binary computer, like a, like a quantum open source or a free quantum machine that everyone has access to and can read the code and see that it's actually doing legitimate work to figure out that if you Wear blue today, you're likely to have these kind of interactions because the weather is this temperature and 95 million other people have reported that they want to eat broccoli, so the color blue is making them 10% more likely to gain one degree of heat in their body. You know, like crazy calculations that a quantum computer could do. That could help, that, uh, that could help, but who programmed the fucking thing? You know, some human, right? Maybe if we, if we can build a machine to program a machine, that we can all agree on, if we can get maybe 99.97% of the humans to agree that that's the right thing, maybe we could do it. But then I don't want to sit around for 20 years waiting until everyone agrees. So someone's got to persuade everyone to agree. Hey man, I'm just riffing here. I'm like Bill Burr. No, I'm not like Bill Burr, but I love you, Bill. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just figuring out uh, a possible step into the next generation future that works probably mimicking nature I'm looking at a bunch of palm trees right now <sighs> so mimicking natural structures is probably what's going to help us get by more LSD must be had more mushrooms must be eaten. More psilocybin must be understood. You know the whole story of Jesus and LSD, right? He did it. It wasn't called LSD then, it was called ergot. I don't know what the, what, the Latin word, what the fuck language did they speak in, in Israel, Jerusalem, Hebrew? I don't know what they called it, but man, they ate it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up ergot and it will alter your perception of reality. It's the, the fungus that they derived LSD from. And it was very common back in the day for people to eat ergot, to dose, and then have hallucinogenic experiences, religious they would call, or pontifications. job to do. So do you. Well, here I am signing off from the top of the world. I'll show you the palm trees I was talking about. Let me pick this up. Move it around. Let's see if you can catch a glimpse. I see I got this table that I'm on right now. Oh, there they are. Right there, those palm trees. And if you're here in person, it's a much better view. Palm trees are cool. I never saw them before uh, Before I came out to L.A. I'd never seen a palm tree in real life before I moved to L.A. Isn't that crazy? I remember the night I got here. I was in Chicago. I was in Chicago that day. That's crazy. I was in Chicago. And I flew out. My girlfriend moved out to L.A. We'd actually broken up. She left. She went to L.A. I was in Chicago. 
and I decided I'm going to go to L.A. So we got to talking, and I was like, I want to come out here. Let's get back together. And she was into it, so I landed at LAX. I was shipped everything out. I think I, I, that's irrelevant. But I landed at LAX, and they, and she and her friend Shannon picked me up, and we, they drove me through from LAX to Hollywood, basically. If you've ever driven that, you know what I'm talking about. But like down S Sunset, I remember driving down Sepulveda, was it? But I didn't know any of the streets or anything at the time, and I was just, it was nighttime, and I was looking out the window at all the palm trees, and the weather was like, because I'd moved out, I think it was in May, and it was super humid in Chicago, which it almost always is, and the dry, it was like this dry, warm temperature, and the excitement of being in Los Angeles for the first, like, I'm here now, this is it, man, I'm like, I live in L.A. now palm trees and the lights and the buildings and like I'd seen tall buildings with big bright lights but not like LA and LA it's the buildings are smaller so it's not like New York where you have these giant skyscrapers and these giant flashy billboards it's more like shit's just lit up in a nice peaceful calm way here the, the, the air is very clear I don't know if it has something to do with less humidity so the lights not getting diffracted as much and we went to her bungalow and uh, hung out there for a few days. And man, what an introduction. I, if you have never been to this city, you have to come. You have to check it out. This is, you know, the whole desert's like this. Like if you go east, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's this temperature and this kind of trees and mountains and things and it's beautiful but LA, I'm looking around at just rooftops and, and fascinating architecture like Spanish Mexican architecture mixed with like nouveau modern American architecture like the, the square buildings and like the round arcs of yeah like kind of like these like these it's almost like uh, Arab I'm looking at like a uh, Sultanesque view and the color out here. San Francisco's got some crazy colors too. Like at one building will be pink, and then the next one's mint green. The next one's purple. You get some of that down here, not as much. Uh, but this place is so much bigger that it's hard to to locate exactly if it's as much or not. It's because in San Francisco the houses are like squished together. You know, they're all like house 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 on a hill like going up and you see house 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 purple green yellow red <laughs> it's awesome <laughs> really uh this is a lot of psychedelic drugs involved in that no doubt um but here man you'll just be driving down some roads and the houses are just like dude it's fucking it looks like what are they called uh what are they called those those spanish looking haciendas a via, I don't know what the fuck you call them. I'm done. I'm out. Well, it was great getting back in touch with you, that's for sure. So I'm going to get out of here, probably head back down to my house, the downstairs part. And I'm going to build something out. I'm going to design something for mines where it'll help us catch spam. That's my, that's my main task right now, streamline some of the admin labor. Well, see you later.